Hi folks, so this is the first video on the topic of access controls. Uh, access controls are like really fundamental to cyber security and in fact just security generally uh, because basically the, the idea of access controls is anytime you are deciding whether someone or something's allowed to access some resource, that is a form of access controls. And so there's a lot of really important concepts and terminology around how we think about how to, to enforce access controls, how we make decisions about access controls, um, that we're, we're going to cover in a few videos. Uh, but let's just you know start with uh, an introduction to some important concepts. So, you know, you've probably heard the term access controls, you know, quite broadly uh, used outside the outside cybersecurity. So, if you have a gate gated area and you need to, and it restricts access into a building or out of a building, um, that is a form of access control. And you can talk talk about that in terms of access controls. And so, physical security people will. Just call that, you know, refer to access controls as like swipe entry to buildings, gated areas, um, even locked doors are a form of access controls. We're a bit more interested in the um, the digital area and the cybersecurity aspect of access controls, uh, which is where we're restricting the access to resources and interactions like digitally. So, access controls is. It's, a, it's about authorization, so that's when you give permission to someone to do something. So if I authorize a user to do something, that's basically saying, yeah, I give you the permission to do these things. Uh, and then the access controls are used to, uh, to mediate the access to those resources. And the, that terminology you know, comes back that we um, described in the authentication topic. So we've got subjects, which are like the active entities on a system that are trying to do something, and the objects, which are the usually passive resources that the subject is trying to access. Um, there's, a, there's another concept of, or, or there's another terminology is sometimes used as like the principle. And the principle can be the, like the abstract idea of there being a person that's sat at the computer. And, um, and, and then the subjects are the processes that they have running. Although, to be honest, in the literature, sometimes the word subject, it refers to the user as itself as well. So but you've got these subjects that are the things trying to access it, and objects which are the things that are being accessed. And we have a, depending on the type of access control that's in place, you have different kinds of security policies. It's basically the rules about what's allowed to happen. And so the access controls are like enforcing those policies to mediate the access in terms of what's been authorized. So the, the parts of a computer system that are critical to actually successfully doing access controls, so enforcing a security policy, is referred to as the Trusted Computing Base, or the TCB. And that refers to like all of the parts where if they're not working properly, the security falls down. So essentially, you know, you've got your operating system kernel, all that stuff that runs at that higher privilege level, all the processes that are running at that higher privilege level, and the PC hard hardware itself. All that stuff is part of your trusted computing base, because if there's something wrong there, then things are going to fall apart in terms of pe being able to restrict access to things. Um, and so, you know, there's the, all the other stuff, like the different low-level privilege stuff that's running on the system. Um, shouldn't be part shouldn't be part of your trusted computing base. Your, your trusted computing base should be resilient enough to have attackers trying to access things, and it can um, basically make the access decisions and enforce them. So that obviously relies on the fact that you've got complete mediation. So there's an important um, security design principle that. The, the principle of complete mediation, which is basically that it shouldn't be possible for someone to circumvent the security that's in place. So, for example, if you had two different commands that read a file, if you have access controls that are in place, those access controls have to apply to both of those programs, for example, to both of those commands. If they don't, then 
you know, your, your security system falls apart very quickly. So the concept of a reference monitor is essentially that you've got a, um, sometimes referred to as a security kernel, you've got that access, con um, the, the, re the reference monitor that mediates the access. So you've got, you know, for example, it's, you, it's often like in the operating system itself, you've got a, a um, part of the operating system that is enforcing the security and that is that is the reference monitor so when you have a um, access request come in um, from a subject we um, have to have already authenticated that subject so that we've already bound the identity to that subject and then we um, basically have a um, the, the 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 request come to the reference monitor the reference monitor decides whether or not they're allowed to do that and if they are then they get access to the resource and if the reference monitor doesn't let them access it then you know the basically applies a um, like a decision algorithm and then enforces its decisions so um, yeah that's a high level view of the just an important concept that you have this reference monitor that is uh, basically enforcing the, the security decisions and it shouldn't be possible for you know this um, principle or, or subject to be able to like um, make a request to access that object except through the reference monitor so you know for example through the um, like Linux kernel for example on a Linux system the requests go through the reference monitor that makes those decisions Uh, so, on a um, computer system, you've got all these different processes that are running. So these are all the different programs that have been started, and that they are, are you know, in memory and they're, you know, being processed. Uh, and each of those processes will have information attached to them. Uh, you know, obviously about lots of different things. But one of the important pieces of information that's attached to each process is the security context. So that's like all the information that's attached to the, the process that's used to make security decisions. On a Linux system, that's primarily the UID, so the user ID and the GID, the group ID that's attached to that process. Like in, in the f first instance, that's what's used to make security decisions. On a Windows system, it's the SID, so security identity. Um, that is attached to each um, process on a Windows system. And so uh, you could think of the protection state as being the, the snapshot in time of what all the security contexts are. So what are all the processes that are running and what permissions and privileges do they have while the programs, while the, the system's running? At that moment in time, that's the protection state. And every time something changes on the system like a new processor start process starts or you know where a process gets extra privileges and permissions which we'll talk about you know soon um, that causes like a transition to having a new um, protection state or a new set of security policies that apply to different processes uh, and things like that so on a system that you're using there's just like that continuously there are the protection states changing because programs are starting, the, you know, the, the, like, the security context will change that's attached to it. Um, often the security context won't change very often, but like there are, will be instances where, where, they will, where that will change for a running process, or the process just stops or it starts a new process and things like that. So um, the security policy is the set of rules that expresses what's allowed. Um, so we're mostly talking about uh, digital systems where we've got access controls like on an operating system and that's things like file permissions. So that's like a, a formally defined policy that says who's allowed to do what because it's stored somewhere and it's in a very um, clear set of rules that says who's allowed to access the file. Um, and you know we'll soon come to the topic of how you store that policy and represent it. In a separate video, you know, for example, you can attach it to a file, or you can have a you could have a, a file that has a set of rules described in it in a in a rule language, um, and so a policy can be described different ways. You can have an informal policy, so 
uh, you can have an access control policy that's like, you know, when you're at work, you're not allowed to use Facebook. And that's kind of like a, an informal policy for a company. Um, but, you know, we're mostly talking about the, the formal, like just um, explicit uh, rule based or, um, you know, clear set of, of rules that, are, that uh, define what a process is allowed to do. Uh, and that security policy basically defines what is secure, quote unquote, secure for a system. So this is what we're trying to enforce. And if, if those rules are broken, then it, it's insecure. But if the access controls are working, they'll continue to be enforced. Um, <clears throat> and our policy can be driven by different kinds of needs. So we might have a policy that is about who's allowed to access some information, so around confidentiality. It might be about who's allowed to make changes, so about integrity, or just about who's allowed to access certain resources. Um, and so, you know, that's around availability. So, um, the difference between a, an access control mechanism and access control model is a mechanism is actually the actual thing that is some actual software that's enforcing a policy. So, like, reference monitor is an abstract concept, but we can have, for example, the Linux kernel is, is a concrete security, includes security mechanisms like the file permissions and the, the logic that enforces those rules. Uh, that's a security mechanism or an access control mechanism. And the model is a way that we reason about or represent the rules and the policy. So we might have a access control model that is um, based on set attaching rules versus uh, like access permissions based on roles. So we might have a role-based access control, uh, which we'll talk about in a, in a separate video, but um, you can have uh, basically assign permissions via roles rather than directly to people. Uh, and that, those are different kinds of access control models, uh, that different ways of like reasoning about it. And there are, um, you know, you can use uh, formal notation and formal reasoning to try and uh, try, to try and uh, validate uh, the security of a system. Um, but the, you know, that's not usually the case. We do, we'll have a set of um, digital rules that are um, enforced, uh, that enforce a uh, you know, specific set of uh, authorization. So, um, so yeah, there's confidentiality policies that basically deal only with confidentiality. So the, these are kind of old fashioned and um, the, you know, that's popularized by the military. You've got integrity policies that deal only with integrity. And, um, but the, basically these are kind of academic now. Like they were real systems that were developed back in the, um, you know, golden age of computers being invented kind of thing. But, um, you know, nowadays we know most, most places have a combination. They're trying to um, not just worry about either of those two, but a combination of those. Um, but we do normally have an emphasis on one or the other, like whether or not, what do we care most about? We should be able to say whether we care most about someone getting access to the thing or someone editing the thing. So there are different types of access control systems. There are discretionary access control systems, which is where um, the users have a choice as to defining what, um, the, but what the rules are for the things that they own. Um, and you've got non-discretionary access controls, also known as mandatory access controls, which is where you have rules where the users don't get any say over the rules. Someone else defines the rules. Um, and uh, we'll come back to that on the topic of access control models, and we'll talk about all of that in more detail. But it is worth saying in this introduction that the most common way of describing permissions is through access control lists. So there's lots of different ways and we'll talk about that later. There's like capabilities and, and, all, and all sorts. But generally speaking, access control lists are the most common. Uh, and basically, the, how an access control list works is you've got a, a list that's attached to each object. So file, for example, has a list of who's allowed to access that resource. And so, for example, you've got a file on a Windows or a Linux system, and it's got a list of users and, and what they're allowed to do to that file. Now on Unix um, and, and Linux, the, uh, the default security way that the security works is you've got this abbreviated access control list that, that 
So I'm trying to encapsulate all those, those things in terms of just like what the owner is allowed to do, so the person who owns the file, who the group are allowed to do, so the, if the file kind of like belongs to a group, who the members of that, what the members of that group are allowed to do, and um, everyone else, what everyone else is allowed to do. Um, but Linux also supports having full ACLs, kind of the same way that um, Windows does. So access control list, or an ACL, is also you'll hear it referred to as an ACL. So in conclusion, access controls are really important, and they mediate um, actions based on what subjects are authorized to do. Um, and there's a security policy that describes what's allowed. And um, we're going to dig into more detail on some specific points in separate videos.